Um, and now we're going to have a, a panel, a network operators tell all on IPv6 success stories. So I'd like to invite uh, Ian Farr, um, Timo Hilbrink, and Dave Wilson all to come up to the stage here. And we'll kick off with uh, Ian and uh, move down the line, I think. Oh, Timo's going first? All right. There you go. You've been volunteered. Cheers, guys. Um, tell some success stories instead of all doom and gloom um, that we heard earlier. Um, my name is Timo Hilbrink. I work for um, access for all We're a medium-sized ISP in the Netherlands. And um, for a long time already, we've been working with IPv6. And over the years, we have rolled it out. And I think we did it quite successfully. So I'm going to show you a bit of what we did and how we did it and what we came across. But this is who we are. One of the Dutch, first Dutch internet providers in uh, 1993. We were bought by the KPN, uh, or the uh, local incumbent, in 98. Uh, but we still run our own network, so we can basically do what we want to do with IPv6 without the incumbent having to uh, cooperate too much with that. Uh, so a little bit of history. We started with six moments space in 2001. Uh, that's what the allocation looked like. Uh, of course, that doesn't exist anymore, but still a nice piece of history. Um, of course, we got uh, ripe uh, prefixes later on. There are now uh, two slash 29s. And we had a Usenet server. Uh, still have actually read only for the world on IPv6. We've been running that since 2002. And we did the Google IPv6 uh, uh, DNS whitelist um, uh, program when it was there. Not necessary anymore, of course. Um, so yeah, this is the stuff we use, Juniper equipment. Uh, we use AVM Fritz boxes as a CPE. And we uh, have a single session dual, dual stack. And we hand out a slash 48 prefix per subscriber. Now, we started doing a bit of piloting friendly users, employees, that sort of stuff to see if actually the equipment would support it. We did that in, uh, two well, before 2010 already, um, in the years leading up to it. But in 2010, we got it actually to roll out to subscribers, just the friendly subscribers, people that we know, people we know had clue uh, and could, could configure it themselves. It was all manual on our side. There was not a lot of CPEs available back then. And uh, our uh, provisioning system wasn't ready for it yet. But just to get going, we were uh, trying this. And it kind of worked. So uh, later on in August, we said, OK, we'll just do it uh, production level. So we got the subscribers to actually click something in our service center to enable IPv6 on their connection. Quite a lot of people did it, a few thousand. That was all fine. And uh, by the time, our CPEs were also um, capable. Um, in a release firmware, actually. So not a beta anymore, but actually a release firmware. We did all this without having a business case. Because a business case for IPv6 is just not there. Uh, unless you're really tight on IPv4 address space, uh, then it might be a business case. But then still, I think still a lot of um, operators will choose to put out a NAT box somewhere and uh, not uh, all their subscribers, because that's, in the end, probably cheaper than replacing a lot of uh, access routers and CPEs in the field. But since there is no business case, we decided to start early and just take it into our normal life cycle management of our equipment. So anything we bought after 2008 had to have IPv6, otherwise we wouldn't get it. And we do the same for our services. So if we roll out a new service, a new product, it has to be IPv6 enabled, otherwise it's not going live. By doing this, we could take all this sort of stuff in a normal upgrade cycle. So we, in the meantime, we replace CPEs. Same story as what, uh, what Natalie was telling earlier about uh, an ISP that was rolling out CPEs that were IPv6 capable. Well, we've been doing the same over the past couple of years. And that takes a lot of uh, problems with uh, budget out of the way. Um, so in, yeah, in 2012, we enabled it for all new lines. So all new subscribers got automatically an IPv6 connection. Uh, most of them don't even know. If you ask our, the, our average customer, do you have IPv6? They say, probably not. I have no idea. 
but they do. Uh, and since we went through a few cycles of upgrades on our uh, access equipment, we were, we were able to enable it on all lines in uh, June this year. There's actually an interesting point because at that point we had about 80, 90,000 subscribers on uh, V6. And by enabling it on all capable lines overnight, we added another 50,000 to that. So our support department was very nervous about this. Um, but it actually turned out quite, quite well. Uh, to be honest, we didn't tell the support manager about turning it on because we thought he was going to block it, afraid of a lot of extra calls, but they weren't there. So do these customers actually use IPv6? Does, is there actually any traffic? Yes, there is. We do about 14, 15 gig in peak of IPv6 traffic to our end users. So yes, it is being used and it's real traffic. Unfortunately, we're one of the few in the Netherlands doing this. Um, as you uh, saw the, the uh, table that uh, Natalie showed from uh, APNIC, this is the, uh, st the, the chart for the Netherlands, and we're doing about 60%, uh, and the rest is barely doing anything. And if you look at the, the graph, you can actually see when we turned on IPv6 for all our customers in June this year, because you see a steep line there. So we're probably doing about 90% of all the IPv6 uh, subscribers in the Netherlands. In, within our company, within our AS, this is what you, uh, what you see. So we're close to about 60% at the moment. And uh, it's still climbing because there's a lot of, there's still people who have an old CPE at home and haven't upgraded yet. So as soon as they reach our support department, the support department ships them a new a CPE and they become uh, IP6 enabled as well. This is the, the equipment that we use. We did a lot of development together with uh, our CPE vendor. Uh, they actually were quite interested in doing IP6 as well. They thought it was cool. So back in 2008 already they started uh, developing kind of on the side, un unofficially. Uh, developing uh, IP6 stack in the CPE. Uh, we did the same with uh, Juniper. We did a lot of testing uh, together with Juniper on the, uh, especially on the access uh, part of the network. Uh, of course, the Juniper stuff all in the backbone was already, uh, already done. That was pretty, pretty stable. But on the access side, there was a lot of uh, development to do. Also, actually, with our uh, the circuit provider, we use uh, KPN as a as a transport uh, network. And it's a sort of semi-transparent uh, layer two uh, network, but it is not really transparent. So there's some some little things sometimes. So they upgrade a DSLAM. We can we sometimes see IPv6 break, and we have to um, pull the brakes really because the uh, telco doesn't notice because they don't do IPv6 themselves. But they listen to us, and we'll sort out the issues. Uh, so yeah, we do. Uh, IPv6 in our uh, co-locating network as well, something that we do. Uh, so, like, like I said, all the new services, all services, all the new services always have IPv6, and we're still busy in uh, in just taking servers every now and enabling IPv6 if it's not enabled yet. So we have our sysadmins have the task as well to go through all the servers, and when they touch a server and it doesn't have IPv6 yet, they do that on the fly. Now, a lot of people ask, well, you know, we're going to always support calls. What is happening? What is going to break? We're afraid to turn it on because the internet is going to break and our customers are going to be unhappy. The most common issues we see is this, which is a website that is obviously not configured for IPv6. And you get the message, Apache is functioning normally. Uh, what's happening a lot is that hosting providers they turn on IPv6 in the hosting environment, but don't, don't bother to tell the customers to actually update their uh, web server configuration. So we get a lot of these, and then always the message is, it is only broken for x for all customers and not for anyone else in the Netherlands. Oh, that's right, because no one else does IPv6. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, we, we're actually quite active in chasing after hosting providers and get them to, uh, to educate their customers or assist their customers in. Uh, configuring the web server so that we get uh, rid of these sort of messages. Another thing we came across is that uh, uh, Outlook 2003, yes, it's still being used. 
can't handle dual stack server addresses if it tries to use pop or IMAP, it just breaks. Uh, so we have had to switch off IPv6 for these customers, they can do it themselves in the CPE actually, or encourage them to upgrade to something new, uh, and that works. And we also saw some intermittent connectivity issues with Microsoft Outlook 365. I still haven't actually been able to point it, to pinpoint it, but there is something in the server farm at Microsoft that sometimes stops working on IPv6. Maybe there's a server that's not right, not correctly configured, so when you get load balance to that server, it stops working. Uh, but that is about all the support calls we get related to IPv6. So. Uh, I think on the 50,000 customers that we did overnight, I think we got maybe 20 calls. So I think that's pretty good. And they were all actually easy. They were all the same problems, so they were easy to fix or easy to explain to the customer what they had to do to fix it. So that is a bit of the success story, I think. Um, the, I think the, the main point is that, well, in my, in my opinion, there is no business case for IPv6. And the only way to do it is to roll it out with your equipment and make sure that everything you buy these days works. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello there. Um, my name's Ian Farah. Uh, I work for Deutsche Telekom based in Germany. and. Um, I'm not sure if there's going to be a presentation or not. Let's see what it turns up. Um, I, actually, I'll take the first slide if you've got it, but uh, well, that's as far as I'm going to go. So um, we saw earlier some um, of the success that we've had in Germany with actually getting V6 out to end users, and you know this is starting to reflect itself in the stats. Um, Obviously, I work for the company, and uh, you know this has been a very big success for us. But the point that I'm actually involved with, and where where my architectural work is for the company, is around not building dual stack networks, not offering these things to customers, but saying how can we go a step further and build single stack V6 only networks. Um, and we have now working prototypes of this. Around 2013, we spent um, a lot of time in things like RIPE 67 meeting, the IP version 6 um, World Conference in Paris, uh, advertising what those things are. So I'm not going to reiterate those things to you, but um, what I would like to talk to you about is some of the things that, that I've learned whilst um, building single stack networks, designing these things, and, uh, you know, and, and um, hopefully some of those things may be of use to you. Um, I originally prepared this presentation, but um, I'm also not going to use this. It will be uh, given away as part of the slide material, but uh, for running time, I, I, I cut it short. So if you're interested, in fact, in what, the, uh, what if the push me pull you doesn't exist, please read it, and then please ask me uh, the answer if you can't work it out for yourself. So the first thing that I think is maybe not obvious to everyone, and you know, I mean, we've seen the number of people who say they've got no plans, they do their yearly business review, uh, and the answer comes up, no business case this, next, this year, let's try again next year. You've still got to get your techies ready. You've still got to be working on this stuff because the learning curve is much bigger than you may anticipate. And even if you don't think you're going to do it this year or next year or even the year after that, you've got to be working on it now. It's not something you can learn in a five-day training course. It's not something you can learn in six months. And a lot of these things are not obvious. Um, we initially started this stuff by saying, OK, let's get our test facilities, facilities making full end-to-end -end IP version 6 services. So the things that we're doing at the moment, how can we rework all of these things using V6 dual stack and then V6 native? Um, it needs to be end-to-end. -end. If you haven't worked out each different part of the network from the, what you're putting on the ground to the customer to the point where you hand it off to your upstream ISPs, it's not going to work. If your upstream ISP is not supplying you with V6, honestly, by now, change your upstream ISP. Get another one. It's just, you know, it's not excusable anymore. Um, we've gone sort of one step beyond that to the point where we're now using it all day, every day. So on my desk, I have a home gateway which connects through our test network, and that's how I do my work. I use V6 natively for all of this stuff. If I want to use office services, which are on a completely different network, I VPN through, uh, through the home gateway on, our, uh, on my desk. And everyone uh, who's working on our team is working in this same way. We use it, and we do everything with it all day, every day, so that we can find problems and solve them as they occur. And we get the same experience as our customers do. 
So um, I'm probably bound to see this next one, but I, I see a lot of people looking at this as a, how do I get dual stack onto my network? And I think I view dual stack as being a necessary but unpleasant stage that you have to go through. What, the way to think about this is what do you want your network to look like at some point in the future, be it five, be it 10, be it 15 years time, when it's a single stack V6 service. Look at that and then start working back from there to work out how you're going to solve your problems in the dual stack world. Um, you really want this dual stack situation to be as short as possible. I, I mean, um, there was a comment earlier about um, V6 doing things and uh, you know using linked local addresses when no one expected it to and stuff worked when, you know, by rights it maybe shouldn't have or what have you. In dual stack, these things are much more likely to happen and much more complicated to, to discover and troubleshoot. Um, so, you know, you may have things that the V6 part of it is doing some stuff, the V4 part of it is doing some stuff, and you've built a house of cards that you don't know exists. Um, with our V6-only network, we view V4 as being an overlay service. We view L2TP uh, for carrying Ethernet services or possibly um, Layer 3 VPN services. They all get carried over V6. So a single protocol network has then defined how we go about architecting V4 and how we'll go about handling those things. Um, at some point in the future, we can turn V4 off and we can pretend it never happened. Um, so <laughs> the day will come. So um, this is uh, echoing something that Simo, uh, Timo said. Um, with the business case for going and touching systems and changing them by themselves to V6, you're probably not going to find it. But if you're doing the work anyway, don't leave any service not upgraded. And uh, you need to find ways of doing this in every case. Um, we've solved this by being essentially bloody-minded. Um, if a vendor doesn't support version six, then we're not buying from them. It's, it's really as, as cut and dried as that. You know, the, the requirements and things, the right 554 documents are out there if you haven't got your own equivalent of those things that you've developed in-house. But, you know, I've met a number of vendors that say we don't hear the requirements for it. You know, customers are not telling us who wants it. I believe there is no clearer way of sending the message that we want this stuff than saying, if you don't have it, I'm not going to buy it. Um, and my final one, because I think I'm running out of time, is um, this is absolutely a layer three problem and people who do layer three have got to solve it. Um, it's not going to come from management and it's really, I'm not seeing any science coming from applications. So if, uh, if it's not solved by networking people, it's not going to get solved. But the one thing that I think is uh, you know, fairly certain is at some point in the future, if you haven't got it ready to go when your business needs it, then it will be your fault if you haven't done it. I think I might go from here if you don't mind. Um, because I'm, I'm Dave Wilson from HGN and you already know what I think. I got my 20 minutes earlier, um, so I'm going to go as quickly as possible to um, what everyone else here thinks. Um, I, as far as I can see, the main way to get IPv6 deployed uh, in the network is to have long hair. Um, <laughs> But um, really, I mean, basically, I, I work for the Irish National Research Network. We deployed it 11 years ago. You might know us from ftp.hgn.ie, which is, a, among other things, a SourceForge mirror. I think at one stage, we believe it was the busiest uh, IPv6 web server in the world. And we believe this because we ran into bugs no one else has um, and got them fixed, which is great. But I see now where we deploying on our network was easy. But um, what really matters is not us, there's only a few of us in the office, it's our customers that matter, it's the uh, education institutions and the, um, the offices and basically the enterprises. You can think of a, a university these days as an enterprise, I, I think. Um, and um, I think that's where success should be measured. And what we see there is a couple of them have, um, and they see a certain amount of traffic, maybe 5-10% of um, sustained traffic where they have a serious deployment. But I don't understand how to make that sustainable. Um, I don't see how whatever convinced one customer to, uh, to deploy V6 works for the next one, or even works for the same one when they have a, a turnover in staff and they have to reiterate on the network. So I want to ask about um, incentives. The, the incentives 
I, I was talking to people at lunchtime and I was hearing things like there's, there's no incentive to replace a network that's good enough. And there's not even really incentives for the, for the vendors to push IPv6 over certain other technologies because it doesn't sell kit as well. Um, and there's not really a, an enormous incentive, certainly once you get out into the long tail, to provide content in V6, which sounds a lot to me like pre-disruption. It, it sounds a lot to me like there could be something done here, but no one currently in the market has an incentive to do it. Eventually, someone else who's not us will find a way to do it. Um, and I guess my question uh, for the audience here is, who's deployed IPv6? And, um, uh, or who has tried and had difficulty doing so? I uh, can I have a, a show of hands. Who's tried to deploy V6? Quite a lot. Who's, who, um, can you put your hands up if you tried and failed? So my question is, what would need to have been different for that to work? Would anyone like to, to take the microphone about that? Yeah, it wasn't a case of failed, but chickened out. Um, I was ready to go, and I took the Lear training and panicked about the addressing plan, so I removed all the configuration. It was a new network build-out. We were doing an upgrade, so that was our story, but we're going to go again in the near future. The, can I ask you, the interesting thing about it seems to me you, you weren't under the gun to do it, you just wanted to do it, but we there were some obstacles. Because we were completely replacing um, all of our routers, so, um, but I freaked out thinking I was using my IPv4 conservative approach to everything and hadn't really got addressing in v6, so um, I undid it all before we deployed it. Um, but we, we're, we're going to push ahead with it one okay. day. Gotcha, I hear you. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to pin all that on you because I, I freak out on my job about four times a day, uh, on, on a good day. Um, but I, I do see it as if, if the incentives are there for me to get something done, then it'll get done, and if there aren't, it won't. Neil. Neil O'Reilly again. I used to work for a university in a city two hours drive south of here, or maybe less. And now that I don't work for them anymore, I'm perhaps freer to talk about what happened. And I put my hand up to say we failed uh, and it's only partly true. We failed in the sense that we didn't achieve what we set out to achieve, and probably because we set out to achieve it in the wrong kind of way. A colleague and I decided as a kind of skunk works project, and as, as, as the, 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 one of the speakers was saying earlier, this has to be done by the people responsible for layer three, but it's a good idea to get your layer nine people behind you. Uh, at the right moment, and we didn't, and that was why we failed. And we came across a quiddity of the operating system on our externally facing web server, uh, which had the effect that when we added an IP address, an IPv6 address, uh, to an interface without rebooting the system, IPv4 stopped working properly. So that was, that was a kind of epic failure which set back the mindedness of the people responsible for Layer 9 in the organization where I worked for a long time until somebody came with a strong customer requirement, a, a, uh, an international organization decided to visit our campus and demanded native IPv6 and we had to do something. And that was a better success. But that again was only a partial success because we did what was necessary. And the reason we did what was necessary rather than a, a universal forklift upgrade of the entire campus network was because we found it was a lot of hard work. And it wasn't just at layer three, it was at layer two as well. Because there are things, uh, and, and I, I, I learned why actually uh, over coffee yesterday. And it turns out that if your ethernet switches aren't doing multicast properly, then you can't do the layer three stuff properly. And so there's going to be a lot more failure, and people are going to have to be uh, prepared to fail and encouraged to fail before they can succeed. I, I have some personal experience around that on, on some recent um, um, proof of concept work that we were doing, whereby 
comparatively large layer three domains, or a number of hosts in there, um, really ramped up the amount of ICMP to, to the rate where control plane policing kicked in and all of a sudden nothing's working anymore. And uh, I mean, I think it's one of those things, you know, particularly in enterprise environments, you can see very large layer two domains, people have, you know, um, have built like that for some time. And there does need to be some rethinking around layer two as, as well, you know, and I, I believe that the only way that you can really tackle these things is, is to get your labs and get the thing built in, in scale as much as you possibly can do and try and simulate it in advance. It's, it's also interesting to hear that the, um, the w one of the major pushes was someone, a, a single customer asked for it. And I, I fear sometimes, it reminds me a little bit of, of banner ads on the web in the 90s, uh, where I think for a while banner ads were, were new and shiny and people were getting venture capital to, to buy them up to promote the new website, which of course was selling banner ads to other websites that had venture capital to buy. And it was just a great big circle. I, 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 eventually they got out of that state, of course. Now we have the perfectly sustainable business practices as a web today, sure. But um, it, it seems like V6 is sometimes still back there. Well, with regard to um, what you call the layer nine people that need to be involved, I can, I can say from my experience that it is definitely the case. And that is why you need, within your company, you need someone to pull it and to be the evangelist and get people on board. And it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to get people interested because they all have their own agenda and their own priorities and, and, and projects. But in the end, you cannot do it without them. So you really need someone in the company or a few people, and that's usually the network people, to actually drive it and get everyone uh, aware of it. We did a lot of internal training as well. So. And before, before I relinquish the microphone for the huge queue of people behind me, I want to mention one more positive note. There is also the serendipitous effect of the law of unintended consequences. Uh, January 2013, we outsourced our email to Google. That sixified a lot. Uh, Rob Speed, BBC, a little bit louder than I thought. Um, so I tried to deploy um, IP6 back 2008 um, when I worked at Aston Martin and Ford sold Aston. We had to create a new network. I uh, ran seriously short of um, intelligence um, and knowledge. So. Um, abandoned it, um, but it occurs to me that LARs are offering slash 64s, slash 56s with impunity. Why not just offer slash 120s and give people CPEs with um, an IPv4 stack and IP6 stack, so you've got the inside being IPv4, translate it to IPv6, and you've just got a one-to-one -one relationship at slash, one, uh, slash uh, 120. Well, if you want to enable the customer to have an IPv6 on their LAN, then a normal LAN uh, assignment is a slash 64. So if you give them less than a slash 64, they cannot actually do much on their LAN. Yeah, but the customers, they're, 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 they're used to IPv4. It, they understand it. So just give them something that they want. The infrastructure further along can be IPv6. However, CPE equipment is, is dual stacked. Right. Oh, crikey, this is, this is creating a, a massive queue. Are you all coming up to beat me up or something? Uh, sorry, um, given the queue, I think we're going to have to close the mics <laughs> looking at the time, but continue on. Thank you. Um, Ray Bellis, Nominate, speaking as my capacity as co chair of the Home Networking Group at ITF. Uh, no, just no. <laughs> I don't agree with that, but I'll have that debate another time. I just think um, we often make the mistake of assuming our customers are like us. Please don't make that mistake. Anyone who would love to come here in the UK to one of our call centers and actually survive an eight-hour shift, I challenge you. Because I don't think you realize how difficult that deployment is with users is or is going to be. Um, and, and, and largely, most of our people don't understand IPv4. Um, 
and most of our customers don't understand or don't even know about IPv6, which is how it should be, in my mind. But here's my, um, here's my question for the panel. Fast forward 10 years from now, right? And I have a view, I mean, I've been banging the IPv6 drum for a very long time. I've supported 6UK, I've done a load of stuff um, in companies I've worked for. I'm, we're driving out in BT, we're probably, um, we're probably going to do it just as we need it. Why isn't just as we need it good enough? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I didn't yeah, so, so why? So it's kind of, in, uh, let me take my previous company I worked for, um, Cable and Wireless, rolled out IPv6 into the transit network 11 and a half years ago. Um, and great, it works. It, they, you know, they've sold some of it. Have they made any money out of it? I can tell you for a fact. No, they didn't. Um, and, and in BT, we will roll it out as we need it, i.e. when IPv4 is at a point where it's, it's exhausted and we can move on to IPv6. Why isn't that good enough? I... And then I think we'll have to close the queue right behind Mike there. Um, Sorry, guys. I apologize. Well, briefly, I'm going to point to Jeff Houston for the answer to that, and he talks about people hitting different pain points at different times, uh, and he talks for 45 minutes about this, which I'm not going to do now. Okay. Um, but good, there, there is an answer thing. on why, it, it, why coordination seems like a good idea. For me, the question is, is it possible? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Mike Hughes, um, I'll put my UK NOF hat on because it's about this. You're actually in a, um, a deployed V6 but chickened out scenario. You're sat in one right now. Um, although you've all got V6 and it all works and it's great. And that's because we bought our, all our own access points. Originally, we were going to use the Aruba gear that already exists here in the venue and just sit our tunnel endpoint router between the Virgin Media DMARC that, that's a, bring, there's a gig to the building, in case people are wondering. There's a gig to the building and then a 100 meg drop to our tunnel router. And the idea was we just put our tunnel router in between the Virgin Media DMARC and the Aruba and everybody would be happy and our SSID would come out of the Aruba gear. Unfortunately, the Aruba gear didn't like forwarding V6. And um, it, this is no disrespect to the venue because the venue is fabulous in, 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 in so many respects. Um, it was just, it, it's difficult because they don't have V6 native in the building. And it was just the path of least resistance was to um, chuck five access points in the suitcase as well as the um, tunnel endpoint route. And indeed, the connectivity here did come in a suitcase with me on the fly from London. Anyway, there you go. Just as a, just an anecdote of, of, of a chicken out and where, where, what sort of things you do come up against. And it was the fact that their IT guys, it wasn't a priority for them because we could just work around it ourselves, which is what we did. Thank you very much. Have we any closing remarks? I think you've heard it all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.